Welcome everyone to the sixth webinar in the ALIA series Tools for Transformation. My name is Adrian McCurdy and today we have a chance to explore some of the frameworks and tools that are being prototyped across the ALIA network. And today's uh, webinar is on tra transformative scenario planning with Adam Kahane, who's a longtime faculty and friend of ALIA. He currently lives in Montreal and Cape Town, and he's also authored several books, including Solving Tough Problems, Power and Love, and Transformative Scenario Planning. And he is the chairman of Rios North America. Today he is going to speak about transformative scenario planning, as I mentioned, and it's my honor, Adam, to welcome you. Uh, thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Happy to be back with Alia. Um, which has been an important community for me over the, the past 10 years and happy to be doing this webinar and seeing lots of old friends uh, among the attendees. Absolutely. Uh, is that okay, Adrian? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, just by way of introduction, uh, the organization I am a member of, uh, Rios, uh, helps people uh, move forward together on their most important and impossible issues. Uh, we, the people we work with includes uh, people from government and business and civil society, uh, usually working in uh, heterogeneous teams together, and the, the important and impossible issues we work on uh, range from environment to health to children's issues to peace uh, to food issues. But we've been doing this in one way or another for 20 years. We have offices in seven countries and have, and have worked in more than, more than 70. In, in doing this work, there's two primary tools we use. The first is the social labs, and there was a webinar a few weeks ago with, with my colleague Zaid Hassan. And the second tool we use is this tool of transformative scenario planning that I'm going to talk about uh, now and at the very end I'll, I'll uh, make the connection between the social labs work and the transformative scenario planning work. Uh, what I thought I would do is break the webinar up into two parts. Uh, firstly, talk about uh, what transformative scenario planning is by telling you a story in three parts and then I'll, I'll pause and there'll be time for your your comments or questions, and then in the second half of the webinar, I'll I'll talk about about how to do it, how to do it, and when to do it, and what results it produces, and and leave a good block of time uh, at the end for a for a second round of questions. So let me let me start then with my story, which I think is the easiest way for me to explain this. Um, I got started in this work uh, about 25 years ago when I um, moved from North America to Europe and started working at uh, the head office of Shell in London. And the reason I joined Shell was because they uh, had a, a wonderful uh, way of uh, doing strategic planning, uh, which they called scenario planning. And that way of doing strategic planning had started uh, uh, almost 20 years before I joined with a um, let me see yeah with a set of scenarios that were produced uh, by a team of shell people way back in 1972 uh, a group led by a man named a Frenchman named Pierre Vac had been doing some analysis of what was happening in the global oil market and started talking within the company about two different sets of possibilities, two different sets of environments or contexts that the company could find itself in. Um, a set of scenarios where uh, the oil market continued more or less as it was, which they called a, a set of muddling through scenarios, and then uh, the possibility that the that because of uh, changed dynamics uh, in the Middle East, there could be uh, several possible crises that could occur 
uh, in the oil market. This was an internal report. Not that much attention was paid to it when it was produced in 1972, but if you remember your oil industry history, you'll know that one year later in 1973, there was a crisis uh, in Shell, uh, sorry, in the international oil market, the uh, so-called Yom Kippur War, where OPEC uh, constrained supplies, uh, there were shortages, and uh, the price went way up. And this, uh, um, uh, of course, it was a, um, a fundamental change in the energy industry, and uh, Shell people then remembered that this was the this was the scenarios that uh, their group had been speaking about, and this is how the scenario method uh, rose to prominence both both in Shell and and elsewhere in the in the corporate uh, environment. And as a result of the um, this capacity to understand and respond more quickly to what had happened, Shell rose from being the, the weakest of the seven international oil companies to, to number one or two. So that's how the this scenario planning method uh, became well known in the world and uh, about 15 years later I arrived at Shell in London and worked on a set of uh, a set of uh, global scenarios. The word scenario actually comes from um, the world of film or play. It was Stanley Kubrick who suggested to the Shell people that these stories that they were developing could be called scenarios. And the key point, the, the, the simple and essential methodological point is a scenario is a story about what could happen. Not a story about what will happen, not a forecast, and not a story about what should happen, uh, not a vision, but a hypothesis about the future that's relevant, challenging, plausible, and clear. Uh, when I got there 15 years later, I worked on my first set of global scenarios uh, that were uh, discuss, uh, presented and discussed within the Shell Group in 1989. Two, two possible um, stories about the business environment that the company could find itself in, a scenario called global mercantilism about uh, blocks in the world and competition between blocks, uh, and a scenario called sustainable world about environmental matters and especially global warming being the most important determinant of what would happen in energy markets. And uh, it amazes me sitting here whatever it is, uh, uh, 25 years later, uh, the extent to which these two possible futures uh, are still in front of us in a week that's seen the publication of, the, of both, the, both the crisis in Ukraine and what it will mean for, for international gas and energy markets and at the same, in the same week the, the latest publication of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the attention that continues to bring to to, to, to carbon issues. Um, the uh, logic for this work or the rationale for this work, uh, this use of scenarios was presented uh, very uh, succinctly by uh, my teacher in this field, my boss at Shell, Case van der Heiden, who said that in organizations there's typically two uh, dysfunctions or, or or dangers. One is the danger of fragmentation, that everybody has a different story about what's going on and therefore doesn't have any common basis, any common language for figuring out what to do. And the second danger, which is groupthink, that everybody thinks the same thing and they all go off the cliff together. And Case pointed out that having multiple, a shared set of multiple stories about what was happening and could happen in the world around us uh, was a neat answer of, uh, to the problem both of fragmentation and groupthink. So, in summary, the the way scenarios were used in Shell, the way scenarios are used uh, uh, in the corporate world, and the subject of 99% of the literature on scenarios has this emphasis on on adaptation, on understanding what's going on in the world, on what could go on in the world, 
so that we can adapt uh, as best we can to a future we can't forecast and we can't control. And that's why I call this a standard application of scenario planning, uh, adaptive scenario planning. Now, during the time I was at Shell, happily working on these global scenarios for this energy company, we received an unexpected phone call from a professor in uh, South Africa at the University of the Western Cape, um, just outside of Cape Town. And uh, the uh, apartheid system in South Africa was uh, uh, still going strong. Um, this system of dividing, uh, of organizing the society by dividing uh, between whites and blacks, but uh, Nelson Mandela had just been released from prison one year before and negotiations were starting on uh, what could come next and Peter LaRue at the university uh, thought that maybe the shell scenario method could be useful as a tool for thinking about how to affect this this transition away from apartheid and he called shell and asked whether somebody could provide methodological assistance and as I was the youngest and most expendable member of the department uh, I was dispatched to South Africa in September 1991 um, in the midst of this optimism and this fear and this uncertainty about uh, what would happen um, and uh, this is how uh, a, a set of meetings started at this conference center outside Cape Town called the Montfleur Conference Center uh, and, and produced what, what is now known as the Montfleur Scenarios. Uh, Peter and his colleagues made a remarkable uh, decision, a real inventive insight, which was to compose the scenario team, the Montfleur Scenario Team, not uh, the way we had done at Shell, uh, just of people from one organization, uh, just from, in this case, the university, but to bring together a team that included actors from across the whole uh, South African system, which meant politicians, including Nelson Mandela's African National Congress and other opposition parties, uh, and uh, uh, parties from the, the white establishment and companies and trade unions and community activists uh, and academics. And it was this theme, team that developed a set of scenarios, the Montfleur scenarios, not really that relevant in 2014, but highly relevant in 1992 when they were published, uh, putting their finger on very much not only what was possible in South Africa, but the choices that, or the, the, the issues and the, that had to be faced and the choices that had to be made uh, by South Africans at that time. A scenario called Ostrich of the government refusing to negotiate uh, with the opposition and trying to carry on like an ostrich with its head in the sand, a scenario called lame duck uh, of a black majority government but which is crippled or incapacitated by a, a constitutional settlement that doesn't allow the new government to deal with the issues facing the country, a scenario called Icarus of an unconstrained a majority government but which ignores macroeconomic constraints and crashes the economy and a scenario uh, called flamingos of what would happen if these three uh, pitfalls could be uh, could be avoided so this was um, my first experience of uh, using scenarios uh, in what we would now call a multi-stakeholder context or a whole system context and um, I noticed that there was something fundamentally different about this exercise. The methodology we were using was exactly the same as the methodology we, we were using at Shell. I didn't know any other uh, way of doing the scenario work, but still something was fundamentally different uh, in the, the energy and spirit of the group. And what I realized, and this really was the 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 discovery that uh, that uh, was the hinge in my in my own um, uh, in my own professional thinking was that whereas at Shell we had told these stories about what could happen in the world 
in order to adapt as best we could. The South Africans were telling stories about what could happen, not as a way to adapt, but as a way to influence what would happen. So in a way, the use of scenarios at Montfleur uh, turned the methodology exactly on its head. And um, I ended up uh, um, uh, very interested in this, this uh, way of working, which I didn't know was possible, this idea that you could use um, that people who uh, have been separated from each other, who didn't know each other or understand each other, uh, or trust each other could could in this way work together um, uh, productively and creatively to influence what was going on around them uh, and I became very interested in what was going on in South Africa and this uh, genuinely transformational moment and also very interested in the woman who was the organizer of the project so by the time the project had ended, I had resigned from Shell and emigrated from, from London to Cape Town and married the organizer of the project. So that's how I got started in this work, and that's how this way of using scenarios that we now call transformative scenario planning uh, got started. Let me tell you uh, one, uh, the, uh, one last story um, as part of this, uh, uh, in this first part of the webinar. And I'm fast forwarding now from uh, this work in the early 90s where we first started doing transformative scenario planning when we uh, founded the, 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 the company that's, that's now called Rios, uh, at, all the way to, to last year where, um, where we uh, uh, did our um, largest uh, scenario project to date. And this is a scenario project. Uh, on the question of drugs, the question of the war on drugs in uh, in the Americas. Uh, the backdrop is that for 50 years there's been one way of dealing with the drug issue. It's called the war on drugs. It focuses on prohibition and interdiction uh, uh, and incarceration. And yet, uh, after 50 years of this method uh, or this approach to dealing with this this issue, uh, uh, addiction and criminality and violence remains high. And uh, almost exactly two years ago today, I think it was maybe, yeah, almost exactly two years ago today, there was a, a meeting uh, in Colombia attended by uh, the presidents and prime ministers of all the countries in the Americas from Canada to Chile. And the host of the meeting, uh, Juan Manuel Santos, the president of Colombia said, I feel like we're on a stationary bicycle. We keep pedaling, we keep doing the same thing, but we look to the right, look to the left, and the scenery is not changing. And what he proposed uh, and what was accepted at this, at this summit of the Americas was to use the Rios uh, transformative scenario planning methodology to, uh, to uh, uh, see if there was another way to, to work on this uh, problem, this <clears throat> problem of drugs uh, in the countries of the Americas, and gave a mandate to the Organization of American States to explore new approaches using the transformative scenario planning methodology. So uh, uh, 20 years after the Montfleur scenario process, uh, a team was again put together of uh, leaders from across the hemisphere, politicians, activists, academics, security people uh, from countries um, uh, from North, Central, and South America and the Caribbean. And again, they produced a set of stories, not about what should happen, not a set of proposals, but a set of stories about what could happen, which um, in essence offered different ways that the so-called drug problem could be understood and different and therefore different ways in which it could be addressed and uh, this set of scenarios was presented uh, a year ago um, by President Santos and Jose Miguel and Sulza the Secretary General of the 
of, of the OAS um, to the other presidents and has become um, over this past year one of the touchstones uh, for uh, the debate over drug policy not only in the Americas but globally and the idea that after 50 years of there being only one story about what the problem was and this what the solution was the contribution of this scenario exercise like in uh, like the previous ones was to to for the first time to open up um, uh, different possibilities and to to get unstuck uh, uh, with this with this new set of options and this new uh, much more open dialogue to enable this problem to get unstuck and for people to move forward together. So um, I wanted to give you these specific examples uh, of the uh, adaptive scenario planning methodology as used at Shell and elsewhere and this transformative scenario planning methodology which we've been using in Rios for the past 20 years starting in South Africa and now used all over the world including this this regional and global set of scenarios on the drug problem uh, as a way of giving you uh, some specific examples. Let me pause there um, and I'm interested in your your questions and observations and then I'll I'll come uh, uh, after that to the, the second part of the webinar about about how do you do this. So over to you Adrian. Great, thank you Adam. So we have a few questions here and the first one has three questions in one. Uh, how are the conditions different today than when you be first began this work? And is there more or less readiness uh, for people to come together across divides? And how do you feel about the future? Are you more or less optimistic about the potential for uh, change? I think the situation is different from 20 years ago. Certainly, uh, the what I notice is that the idea of uh, working on uh, complex challenges using uh, or or working with with what we now call multi-stakeholder teams, teams made up of actors from government and business and civil society working together, uh, was considered quite an odd and unusual idea 20 years ago and is now a quite a commonplace idea and there's lots of people doing this using lots of different methods uh, not only the scenario planning method which is quite specific but this general approach that Zaid Hassan refers to as the social labs revolution so I think there's both a recognition a broader recognition of the need to work in this way uh, and a greater frustration with the inadequacies of of other um, expert-based or authority-based ways of dealing with with complex social challenges. Um, I don't know whether I'm uh, optimistic or pessimistic. I don't really think about things that way, um, but I I think I see what at least what I need to do and uh, and what uh, what Rios needs to do and we're focusing on on doing it and uh, making the contribution we can. The, uh, something that one of my scenario colleagues pointed out to me many years ago is that one of the reasons the future is unpredictable is that we have influence over it. That's the basic insight uh, in this work or the, the, the basis for this work so uh, I'm uh, uh, trying to pitch in uh, to, to make things better and I don't know how they'll turn out. Great. And what does it take to step into this kind of challenging work? What kind of personal capacities and trainings would you recommend? Well, I think this kind of work, meaning uh, work to help people work together to make a difference, um, well, I think I think above all, it takes uh, commitment and 
the willingness to to work with others. Uh, if you if you uh, think you know what needs to be done and uh, you just want to try to cajole or 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 force uh, uh, other people to do what you want to do, that's not always wrong. But that's not what that's not the attitude it takes to work uh, with others. And so uh, th this kind of work is about uh, organizing and supporting and facilitating other people to find uh, to find each other and in that way to to, to find a way forward. And so uh, the capacities that are, that are required, I guess I would call uh, facilitative capacities. Great, thank you. And there's another question here. It says, how do we introduce transformative scenario planning into the process of addressing poverty? So this is not a, uh, this is not, <coughs> not a method that um, is applicable for, for working on everything. There's lots of times when we can uh, solve problems and move forward and get things done uh, by by working on our own or by implementing um, uh, solutions that we think are correct um, but uh, in situations where uh, where no one actor can make progress on their own then these uh, this approach such as the transformative scenario planning approach uh, can be useful and certainly if you think about poverty as an as the symptom of of uh, a structural challenge that uh, can't be addressed uh, by government alone or by business alone or by civil society alone and where what's required uh, in any particular um, situation whether it's uh, at the level of a, a neighborhood or a city or a country or a region is to is to understand that situation as a whole and to have a common language and a common intention uh, for working together then uh, then that's how that's how transformative scenario planning could be useful in in poverty issues, and this is uh, um, th this is the uh, the the reason um, scenario planning is being used by by organizations in in Canada uh, like Tamarack and uh, and elsewhere. Great, thank you. And there's a question here also about uh, transformative and adaptive scenario planning. And is there a methodological difference between the two? So um, th this is important. Uh, the basic methodology, or the, let me say the the narrow methodology for actually constructing scenarios. How do you how do you th think about how do you study what's going on and think about what's certain and what's uncertain? and develop narratives about what could happen is exactly the same in adaptive scenario planning and transformative scenario planning. Um, what's different is the purpose. Um, the purpose uh, being not simply to adapt to what could happen but to transform what could happen. Um, it, uh, beyond that there are important differences that arise from that difference in purpose and in particular the group that does the work in adaptive scenario planning can be a group of experts and in transformative scenario planning needs to be a group of actors a group of stakeholders from across the whole system and secondly the use of uh, or the, the action that arises from the scenario planning at the back end uh, in adaptive scenario planning is 
thinking about what should we do, we in this organization, as a result of these, uh, in order to be able to adapt and, uh, and, and be resilient in the face of these different possible stories. Whereas in transformative scenario planning, the action is about what can we do together with other actors, not simply to adapt, but to shape the future. So the core um, methodology for constructing the scenarios is the same, but the way you, you get going and what you do with the work uh, is different because, because the purpose is different. Maybe Adrian, I'll I'll give the uh, the second part of the presentation, which which is about these questions of how, um, just for about uh, t ten minutes or so, and then leave a a good chunk of time at the end uh, for for a second set of questions. Is that okay? Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me. Uh, say a bit more about the sort of things that people are now asking questions about and uh, to start with by making this point that uh, when uh, the the main emphasis uh, in the literature on scenario planning and when people think about scenario planning is on new ideas new insights or new understandings about what's going on in the system. And that's important, very important. Uh, one of the, the characteristics of scenario work is it is uh, work which is focused on ideas and, and narratives and mental models. So it operates in the domain of how do we understand what's going on in the world around us. But what's become uh, increasingly clear in this work over the past 20 years is there's two other types of results that are important uh, relationships uh, and intentions especially in situations that are characterized by uh, high social complexity and high conflict and and fragmentation and um, separation where actors uh, aren't in connection with each other or don't understand each other or, uh, or, or don't trust each other one of the the important results from working in this way is new cross-system relationships and also when we work together on what's going on and what could go on and how does what we're doing affect what will go on it's possible or what happens is that separately and together we develop uh, or we clarify what it is we need to do uh, given what's happening or with an awareness of what's happening in the system as a whole. And the reason I'm saying this is because it's these three ingredients or, or legs of the stool in this picture, these new systemic understandings, these new cross-system relationships, uh, and these new system-aware intentions which enable uh, new system transforming actions and that's what we've seen uh, uh, th that's what we saw was the result of the work in South Africa and and in many of the the efforts since then uh, including uh, dramatically this uh, this drug scenario work uh, in the past year so I'm just making the the point that scenario work is not just about ideas or understandings it's about understandings, relationships, intentions, and ultimately actions in order to address the issues, the important and impossible issues we're trying to address. Uh, the second point I want to make is about, uh, is about the how. And uh, here I'm uh, making the connection to uh, Otto Scharmer's work on the U process that if we try to break the transformative scenario planning process down into steps uh, um, there is this first step of bringing together a team from across the system as a whole that was the inventive insight from Montfleur 
this step of observing what is happening, and of course there's many ways to do that, but uh, as Otto uh, pointed out to me many years ago, the capacity, the, the effectiveness of our, uh, of our actions to transform the systems we're part of depends above all on the quality of our understanding uh, of the systems so that observing what is happening and then step three the scenario work per se constructing scenarios constructing stories not about what will happen not forecasts and not about what should happen not visions but stories about what could happen this is the the core of the scenario work as such and then uh, to step back and to say if that's what could happen then what is it that can that we can do and what is it that we must do and this is the so-called bottom of the U the um, the formation of intention or will or commitment if this is what's going on in the world around us and this is our part in what's going on in the world around us what is it that we can do what is it that we must do and the paradox uh, at the heart of transformative scenario planning is that we're doing this work because we want to make a difference in what's going on in the world around us and and yet the scenario method as such requires us to be absolutely rigorous in not talking about what we like and don't like what we want and don't want but simply but constructing stories simply about what is possible what could happen and only after that, after step three, to to step back and say, okay, if that's what's possible in this situation, what is it that, that I and we can do, and what is it that I and we must do? And then step five, on the basis of that of that that understanding, these relationships, these intentions, uh, what actions can we take uh, to transform uh, the situation to effect systemic transformation and so uh, the if we try to uh, put this in very uh, um, um, precise terms what we're talking about is bringing together a team from across the whole system a strong container uh, container in the way uh, Crane Stuckey of Alia refers to it uh, a physical, political, uh, 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 emotional space that on the one hand uh, uh, is constrained enough to, to, to create the pressure needed for creativity and at the same time is strong enough uh, for, uh, to, keep the group, uh, to keep the work safe uh, and to allow people to, to, to think and act differently. So a whole system team, a strong container, and a rigorous process. This is a highly structured process. This isn't just getting together to chat. This is a very structured process. And it's a structure that allows the safety and the creativity. The five steps I mentioned, the, th the, the, the three plus one outputs I mentioned, and the outcome we're looking for is systemic transformation, that in work working in this way, with actors from across the system talking about what could happen and what should we do about it and then doing it uh, is what enables uh, us to to move forward on these problems or these issues that are important and that seem impossible. The final point I'll make and then I'll, uh, I'll stop is as I promised to make this connection between the the transformative scenario planning methodology and the larger body of work that we focus on in Rios and that Zaid focused on in his webinar a month ago, the social lab approach, that the transformative scenario planning is a way of getting started. It's, it's uh, powerful and attractive because it's just about telling stories. And so in situations where we need to get together to to work on these important and impossible challenges but we're getting together to to act in alliance is is simply too difficult a way to start it turns out that this 
uh, transformative scenario planning methodology allows us to produce new alliances, new understandings, and new commitments, and then to act together using the social lab approach or another approach to move beyond new alliances, understandings, and commitments to, to new, new initiatives and new, new systemic uh, ecologies. So this is the connection I wanted to make between the, the smaller method, the transformative scenario planning method, and this larger approach uh, of, of social labs, which is the, the, the larger work of Rios. So um, let me stop there again, Adrian. I, I think there's still about 15 minutes, and, and let me just respond to whatever uh, comments or questions that people have. Great. Thank you so much. This has been so wonderful to hear more about your work this way. So we have a question here that says, how do you select the stakeholders and how do you build up the trust to overcome the barriers? Um, well, there, would, there are two ways to put together these teams, these whole system teams or these uh, all stakeholder teams. Uh, you can do it by invitation, where the uh, the initiators of the of the transformative scenario planning work, the 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 two or three or four individuals or institutions that say uh, we need to work in this, we need to try a different approach to addressing these challenges. So you can invite people. Um, with, uh, with trying to find people who uh, care about this problem or this problematic situation and who understand it from different perspectives or different parts of the system and who, who, who together have influence or the capacity to shift what's happening in the system. So that would be one way to do it. And uh, the, the other way to do it, which um, I've not done, but I think is is certainly an important possibility. Is uh, is to expl uh, to to explain or to broadcast uh, what it is that we're trying to do here, and to and to invite people to to uh, to participate or to to apply to participate. So these would be two ways to do it. But in either way, what you're looking for is a group of people. Who, who understand the situation from different perspectives and can influence the situation from different perspectives. Was that the question, Adrian? Yeah, yeah. And there's another question that uh, just came up, which is, what if the actors can't agree about what is actually happening? Just say, for, for example, climate change. Okay, sorry, I, I, I realize I forgot the second part of your previous question, but Okay, but sure. Let's, let me deal with that one. Yes. Um, so yes, when we talk about constructing a shared understanding, uh, that's a bit of a simplification because, of course, there will always be differences in perspective and understanding. Um, uh, and I think at best what, what we can do in in fragmented and polarized systems is developing some common language and I may not see things the same as you but I understand how you see it and you understand how I see it and we see how they fit together. Now it's not always possible for for people to act together and the climate change debate in this respect as in many many others is the extreme example um, where people have non non overlapping or even non compatible understandings of the situation and uh, where this polarization I think is not an accident in climate change and in, in other such situations but an intentional strategy to, uh, of, of certain actors to, to move forward through through polarization. Um, so in these situations, the the practical question is, 
a can we make progress without our opponents or are we stuck uh, if we remain in opposition and if if the latter uh, how can we create some common ground and one of the things that's uh, uh, that I've learned which has surprised me uh, over the last years is uh, frequently in situations where uh, in polarized situations where people have different understandings and different positions often it's possible to move forward in practice even if we don't agree in theory hmm. um, in other words it's not ne it's not necessary for us to it's not necessary for yeah, this is the surprise about this work. We can get going and agree to do things together or agree to do things in alignment that move us forward and give us uh, experience working together and uh, allow us to, uh, to begin to address the situation we're in, even if we don't agree uh, on, uh, uh, even if we don't agree. And so the, the common, the held belief that uh, if we don't agree on definitions and if we don't agree on the problem, we can't start, is not true. And we've discovered this both in sustainability work on, on climate change and on sustainable food, for example, and in highly polarized political situations in places like, like Colombia and, and Zimbabwe and and, and Thailand that that what's the, the crucial thing is to begin to work together to begin to move together and and that coming back to the your 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 previous question trust is built through working together um, and and the scenario method because it's quote only about telling stories unquote enables us to get going together and to work together even though uh, we uh, even though we, we we come we come at it from such uh, different perspectives and I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more about how if you have any advice on how people can start to build that common ground well the 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 trick, if that's the word, of the transformative scenario planning methodology is we build common ground through looking together at the situation we're in and part of. And that, that this provides a low threshold, high ceiling way to get going um, on, uh, on, yeah, to get going and moving forward on on addressing uh, important and impossible issues so we get going by 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 talking about what's going on around us and what's possible in this situation and how is what how is what we're doing uh, affecting what's happening and what's uh, un unfolding uh, in in this situation so the 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 discovery at Montfleur is that this is a way to start this is a way to start working together by this simple exercise of asking the question what's possible here And uh, we have so many amazing questions, so hopefully we can get some more in. Uh, how do you ensure that the attempts to discern what is happening is perceptive and insightful enough to actually move beyond the superficial descriptions of what is happening that dominate our world? Uh, this is a great question, and when uh, this is why the work uh, takes time. So the main thing that is lost in trying to do this work very quickly 
is that it is superficial. And the main thing that's gained in taking uh, in taking some days uh, for this and the, the the middle ground that we've we've settled on in Rios is three workshops of three days each over a over the course of six or nine months. The main thing that's lost in trying to do it more quickly, couldn't we just do this in a day or couldn't we do this just in a couple of days, is that we end up reverting to uh, not just superficial but habitual ways of understanding the situation. So um, how can we get beyond that if we have a little bit of time? I think there would be a lot of uh, conventional methods including any kind of uh, of research or expert input but the the two methods that, that that are probably the most powerful in our practice is first of all working in a heterogeneous group uh, where there are people from different parts of the system who understand what's going on differently and can can help each other uh, have a uh, a richer and more complete and more challenging a set of perspectives on what's going on and secondly the the learning journey approach which has been a central part of uh, uh, all of Rios's work for a long time which is how can we get out of the meeting room and go beyond simply talking to one another and together uh, encounter uh, the situation we're in firsthand how can we visit different parts of the system talk to people um, people engaged in the system, perceptive observers of the system, with an emphasis on uh, what are we not seeing here. So in other words, the left-hand side of the U, the, the observe what is happening part of the, of the transformative scenario planning process, is above all about inquiry. What happens if we suspend our current understanding of, of what's happening and ask what are other ways to to see this situation and that's how we get underneath the the habitual and the superficial understanding and have at least a fighting chance of seeing the situation differently and seeing what's possible in this situation that may not be obvious or may may not uh, yet be manifested so we have time to squeeze one more question in perhaps, uh, which is, can experts be called on to provide solid data as part of understanding the system as well as stakeholders, or is it a false distinction? Uh, yes, there's, a, uh, there's lots of room for, for experts and research and analysis and data. Uh, and the, the, I think the, the small tweak on that is to see these experts as resources to the stakeholders rather than uh, people telling the stakeholders what they what they uh, what they need to understand and so this this um, uh, subtle shift where the energy is coming from the energy and inquiry and 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 demand is coming from the stakeholders rather than from the experts and authorities uh, is what um, what what can shift the dynamic and what we're trying to do in all of this is is help actors act with greater uh, greater um, greater understanding of the whole and yes absolutely there's a place for experts and researchers uh, and data uh, to uh, to inform that Great, thank you. And I'm wondering if this one more question, just a quick squeeze in, would be: uh, Is it possible for this methodology to be easily uh, taught and used by young uh, social entrepreneurs around the world? And I, I would like to extend young to every age. Uh, yes, the um, the the book I wrote is is intended uh, or, or is written as a practical how-to guide. Um, uh, this is. Uh, a relatively simple methodology. It's not easy, but it's it's relatively simple, and uh, I think it can be used by 
by anybody who's who's trying to address uh, a complex problematic situation who's got energy to do that and and uh, sees the need for and is willing to work with others to do that so uh, that uh, that that's the intention of the book is to help uh, is to help people use this approach uh, to work with others uh, to move forward on things that are important but that they can't they can't do alone Wonderful. Thank you so much. Now, uh, if it's okay with you, uh, we're just going to wrap up and I'm going to say a little bit about, um, give you some contact information so that you can uh, get in touch or learn more about Rio's partners as well as, um, and then we're at the end we're going to come back uh, to hear some inspirational last words from Adam. So, uh, it's amazing what they're doing over there with in Rios and if you want to learn more on the screen you can see some of the contact information and uh, find out a little bit more about the courses that they're offering and uh, Adam mentioned that Zaid was also on our webinar and he has he's doing a tour right now a book tour so that might be something you might be interested in looking up as well and if you could sl switch to the next slide please Adam and uh, we have some webinars that are coming up. We have uh, in this series there's Bob Stilger and he's going to be talking about uh, it's a bit of an introduction to the case study that he's bringing to the summer leadership intensive this June in Tacoma and there he's going to mention uh, or get into the learning, the rich learning that they've experienced in the last three years since the triple disaster in Japan and uh, what they've learned about the community building and he's using, I believe a lot of it is the is theory U that they're using there. And we also have Art Kleiner who's coming up and he is going to be giving a webinar uh, case study and also you'll have a chance to spend two days working with Art Kleiner at the Summer Leadership Intensive and he's going to be revealing his new work on the capable company. The next slide please. So as I mentioned we have the summer leadership intensive is coming up and that's an opportunity to spend five days in a vibrant learning community with people from many different sectors, many different uh, backgrounds and it's uh, there are over 30 faculty and we start off each morning with uh, some sort of contemplative practice to help you really come into presence and explore different practices both that you can experience with each other and then take home and what works for you as well and then the afternoons we have or in the mornings we have modules where you can go deep with people like Charles Eisenstein or Art Kleiner uh, or the Shambhala Arts team even and really experience uh, their methodologies that they use and then in the afternoon we have we're shaping systems with the case studies and if you could please flip to the next slide so we have over I think we have about 11 case studies now and it's a great opportunity to see and interact with the learning that's happening on transforming systems we have um, ones on education and contemplation in higher education uh, healthcare and how to transform healthcare systems, food systems, uh, ecosystems and community based transformation as well and we even have one case study on the Egyptian revolution and the, the transformation that happened there and the inspiration that came from that as well. So that's it for me and we can hear from you Adam for closing thoughts. Well thanks uh, thanks Adrian. I think the closing thought I'd like to offer is uh, is the related to the first question you asked me uh, early on in the webinar. Um, my observation after 20 years of doing this work is that uh, more and more often we find ourselves in situations where we can't move forward uh, uh, unless we uh, work together. 
and this means not just working with friends and colleagues but also working with strangers and opponents and uh, we might not want to do this we might prefer to work alone or just with our uh, people who we like and who think like us but but we can't we can't move forward um, unless we were able to uh, to talk and and think and act uh, with others, including people we don't don't know or don't understand or don't don't trust. And uh, given that imperative, this this transformative scenario planning approach and the social lab approach more generally uh, it provides a, a methodology for doing that. And and that's why I think it's uh, it's increasingly important. So thanks uh, for the your sponsorship, uh, Adrian and Susan and Alia, and uh, thanks to, to everybody who, who tuned in. I appreciate the interest. Great. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you, everyone who's joined us, and we look forward to hearing from you. These webinars are recorded, and so you can find them on YouTube, and also hashtag Alia2014. Thank you very much. See you next time.